Um, thanks for the introduction, Jane. Um, my name is David Lee, and thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk about a uh, fourth project I did, and then how uh, I used code and prototypes to um, make uh, quick design decisions. And I noticed that there's a <laughs> client, a, a member from my club, one of the clients, um, I worked uh, with Bespin Global, and then he was one of the member. I wasn't working with him, but like, I'm happy to see him. Um, so I'll introduce four projects. And then this was the first uh, uh, challenge and product I did. Um, and this is a world's first uh, modular portable light. The, the module in front, the light module in front, uh, can be coupled with one of the five accessories in the back. So that's, um, so if you couple with the bike accessory, for example, and then you can use it as a bike light, and then you can, you can use it as a lantern, you can use it as a headlamp. So it, uh, unlike conventional portable lights, where they have one or two buttons to serve only one or two functionalities, um, this product was, uh, was aiming to serve um, different functionalities in different situations because Americans tend to um, do ac outdoor activities more than two. Uh, so like they need many lights for their activities and then they only buy this one uh, set of lights and then they can use everywhere. So the ch challenge I got, how would I design a button interface that fits almost in any outdoor activities? So as I told you, un unlike uh, conventional portable lights, I had to consider six functions, on off of course, and then four, there was a four level of brightness, four colors, spot and float mode, like how wide the beam is, and then stroke, stroke mode, which is blinking, and then lock and unlock mode. Although uh, we only included four of the functions in, in the final prototype, we uh, wanted to explore all the possibilities. And then I drew this table as a starter. So on the left side, I uh, drew one, two, three button interface. I didn't even think about like more than four buttons because it was uh, it felt I felt it was too complicated. And then on the right side, there there are functions. So I laid out and then imagine how each button is serving uh, those functions. Like one button was a bit too complicated to. Uh, serve all the functionalities. Three buttons still, I wasn't sure with, the, with this table. So I started to drew, drew uh, the interface and then made uh, paper prototypes, like three buttons in different styles, four buttons and even five buttons that I used uh, old I, uh, I Apple TV remote controller. Luckily I have, uh, uh, that, that remote controller have the similar size as the, the flashlight that I was making. And then, you know, you, you can now more easily uh, imagining what the final uh, product and the interaction would be like. But I was still, I couldn't make decisions with still with this uh, paper prototypes. So I decided to go further with the prototypes. So I made a, a framer prototypes with one, two, four buttons. There, are, there were more um, prototypes than those four. Um, and then I built those prototypes and then I could try them on my hands. So I could easily figure out how, which one is better. And then I sent those prototypes to my colleagues in, uh, we have an office in San Francisco and Munich. So I sent th those prototypes to all of the uh, offices and then they started to give me feedbacks. And then it was really helpful. And then they, we, even though I spent some time building those prototypes, the decision making process was very quick. Like everyone, most of us agreed on the four button interface because that was the uh, most intuitive for us. And then we decided to go, f go with it. So that was the final prototype, uh, final product. Then we, we had the uh, four buttons and then that, uh, goes well with the overall design language I designed. Then there was the first one. The second challenge I got was that 
I uh, designed one of the Korean music streaming apps, and then there was a, a unique behavior that is only existing in Korea. So my challenge was that, how would I test whether culturally unique behavior is better than the norm or not? So if you use Spotify or Apple Music or other um, into, uh, service, music streaming services outside Korea, you will, uh, would get a similar screen like um, the one on the right. So you, if you have, a, you have a list of songs and then you click one of them and then it plays right away. That's intuitive, right? But all the Korean music apps at the time, and for even now, have the all on the left, which is you have the list of songs and then you tap on one of them and then it's selected rather than played. So you select some, some of the songs you want to listen to and then hit play from the bottom uh, menu. So that's already two step. So we wanted to know if this um, better than the, the model on the right. And then we wanted to compare them because like everybody else outside Korea was using the model on the right. So, so I made a prototype, it's one of, like I made so many prototypes because I was lucky to have some time to build uh, prototypes. And then this was the, one of the prototype. And then that was working, even though it's black and white, it was working, everything is working as the final uh, product. So you, you can also have uh, functionalities on the right side, you can select songs, still like select songs and then hit play and then hit play. So we brought this prototype to a nearby cafe and then just randomly uh, asking people for 30 minutes to test out those uh, and pr prototypes and to compare them. And then we've, and then the the result was like 50-50, like 50% of the people still like the old model and then the other uh, like the, the new model like Spotify. So, and, but more importantly, we discovered that all the Korean um, you, like music streaming service users are actively managing the current playlist. So they have uh, most of the Korean music, music streaming apps support 500 songs uh, for their current playlist and then people are actively managing it uh, which you cannot see in um, Spotify or uh, Apple Music and the reason why was that Korean people are listening to like top 100 songs so that's not changing every minute so you want to select some of the songs and then add if you have the new song, the fifth rank, for example, and then you want to only listen to that song and add it to your current playlist, and then you reorder it according to your taste. And then people were even like, people are very obsessive about the, like managing the playlist, and then they asking for more uh, songs that the, um, in the current playlist. So now it's doubled, like 1,000 songs, and then we wanted to provide uh, a more efficient way to uh, manage the current playlist. So we added uh, uh, sorting options like most played, date added, artist name, and then song title so that they can quickly uh, sort and then listen to the songs according to, to their needs. So by, if I didn't have time, I would have compared just the current app uh, with uh, Spotify, but like they looked so different. So it wasn't fair to compare that, that different uh, apps. So I made a prototypes that has the same interface, but only behave differently. So that we could uh, discover the exact problems. And the third challenge I got was that, as Jane introduced, I'm co-running one of the design um, community here called uh, Design Spectrum. And then every month or every other month, we're hosting an event for 100 or one to 150 people. Then this was one of the uh, events. 
And then every event we make, as an appreciation, we make name tags for the participants. So my challenge was that what if I have to make 100 name tags for every event? So I made uh, one of the events, I made, designed this name tag. And then I started to think, okay, now I have to uh, duplicate this name tag 100 times. And then, and then uh, copy paste names 100 times. That's, if I do uh, an event just one time, it was okay. I could do, do it for fun. But you know, as I told you, we're doing the event every or every other month. So, what, so I wanted to save some time and, and my colleagues' time. So I found out that Sketch had a like, script functionality right into the, the, the app. So I could, uh, write, wrote some code, and then um, this was the result. I could make uh, 100 name tags just with the one button click. And then, you know, just it was done in one second. And I wasn't still happy about it because I have to now print them and then cut them. Still, I have a uh, further process left. So the next prototype I made was this. So um, you have the name tag selected, and then you just, uh, in the input field, you just copy the, all the participant names, and then paste into the text field. And then the, the plugin, sketch plugin, that I made nicely put the name tags into an A4 size paper so that I can print them right away. And then, I'm not sure if you noticed, but there's a like cutting line uh, in case that the, uh, the name tag is in white. So I added a cutting line so that uh, I can cut the name tags very easily. And then I uh, made it as a sketch plugin and I open sourced it. Then some people uh, started and some people forked it to uh, modify it to their needs. And then after this, we uh, hosted if several more events and that, that really greatly helped us to save t my time and also my colleagues' time. Um, challenge four was, the, was about branding. So uh, we were working with a company called Bespin Global, and it's a cloud computing comp company. And the and my uh, colleague uh, June, who's a brand designer, made this set of uh, brand identity. And dot means the data, and the arrow like it goes up to the clouds, and then clouds adapts to your needs, like according to your needs and your, your company, your startup. So it's, it should, the cloud should be dynamic and, and adaptable to your to users' needs. So he made this set of um, identity. Um, so my challenge was that, how do I make the brand identity generative systematically? So not losing the integrity, uh, integrity of the brand identity, but make the set of uh, brand identity generative. So those are not generated by a uh, program. It's all manually done by our brand designer, June. So he made all those uh, very, uh, various pro uh, clouds in Illustrator. And then I wanted to make an app that generate those clouds, uh, various clouds, but have the same, uh, have the consistency. And I started to um, reverse engineer it by uh, examining what uh, the June, the brand designer did, designed. And then this was the first prototype I made. I made the prototype with uh, a program called Processing, and I used uh, Java as a language. And then this was 
how it worked. So you can export um, the logo and then you can put it, import it at, in your one of your favorite graphics tool and then you can change them according to your needs and then there's an image. And then it wasn't still it worked fine, but it only worked on my computer. So I wanted to share this uh, for uh, with everyone, so that everyone can access uh, to this uh, prototype and then and then make their own identity. So I made another prototype with JavaScript, and I, I used uh, Paper.js as a uh, as a library that's um, vector animation library that was really easy to use for me uh, and then this was a, a final prototype you can change some options you can change the colors and then if you like the logo stop it and then export it and then you can use and then make different applications so that was the was my challenge, force challenge, and then through the course of those uh, problem finding and problem solving process, I had a more um, uh, prototypes uh, to solve the problems, and then uh, I learned some lessons. So new. Nowadays, new tools allow designers to, designers to make things faster and better, especially nowadays. And then that means designers are more capable and eligible of doing more than what they used to do, right? And then you have, uh, you're supposed to have more time because you have uh, more uh, powerful tools. And then you can put your more energy into, uh, for example, more business, for example. And then you can more, you can decide uh, uh, take more time into learning how to read data, but I'm saying code can help designers to get closer to real life to solve problems as I showed you And then code can make designers daily tasks more efficient But code doesn't have to be always practical, you know, what if we have to run ahead tools and create the future? Um, how do you design an in-car experience of an autonomous car, for example. We don't have, uh, currently we don't have any prototyping tools that support this function natively, right? So you have a uh, in-car experience, you have a uh, HUD, head-up display, infotainment system, and you have some buttons on your uh, steering wheel. So uh, in order to make some prototypes and then uh, to get hands-on experience, you need to code, right? And then there are limitless possibilities in automobile, AR glasses, foldable devices, transparent display, and so on. So if you if you're um, making prototypes uh, for conventional platforms like mobile uh, smartphones, it's fine. But if you want to uh, make more futuristic, and then you, you want to imagine the future, um, I think. The code is only the solution for us, and the code it gives us freedom, and freedom to explore new and conventional ways. Thanks for listening.